All right, diabetes. Fortunately, you know, probably all you really need to know about it without me having to tell you, but I uh, have yeah, the type 1 and type 2, so let's see what you know, and you just say 1, 2, okay? Absolute insulin deficiency, 1. Antibodies against islet cells, 1. Family history of diabetes, 2. Obesity, uh, ketoacidosis, hyperosmolar nonketatacoma, HLA relationship, one, HLA relationship is one, amyloid uh, in the islet cells, two, type one is an antibody destruction of the islet cell, that's why it's called insulitis, they have an actual inflammation, but Amyloid destruction uh, implies chronic d disease type of thing. That's type 2. Good. That, that, those are the key things. How about insulin? Both. Both. You, can use that. you oftentimes have to use insulin in both of them. Now, one, you always have to use it. But in two, when eventually they get resistant to the sulfonylureas, you have to go the insulin route. So you can't say unequivocally that it's only, uh, it's only oral medications. Good. I remember we said that the, uh, the pathogenesis of uh, diabetes really relates to just a couple very simple processes. One is osmotic damage, and for that to occur, the tissue has to have aldose reductase in it. And so there's only a few tissues that actually have that enzyme. One is the lens, and so uh, if it does, then it can convert glucose into sorbitol, and that's osmotically active, and it sucks water into your lens. i got another board question. I'll come back to that. Uh, pericytes in your retinal vessels, and so if you destroy them, then the, then the retinal vessels are weak, get little microaneurysms, you know, and that's why they can rupture and produce a blindness, okay? A Schwann cell, Schwann cells have aldose reductase, and so the mechanism of peripheral neuropathy, in fact, the most common cause of peripheral neuropathy in the United States is diabetes, and mechanism, osmotic damage. So that's one mechanism. The other is non-enzymatic glycosylization, Remember, no enzyme involved, glucose attaches to amino acids and proteins and renders whatever that protein is, which is usually basement membrane, permeable to uh, proteins. So that, that's operative in uh, hyaline uh, arteriolosclerosis. That's operative in diabetic uh, uh, nephropathy, uh, non-enzymatic glycosylization as well. Hemoglobin A1C is a classic example of glycosylization, and it gives you an idea of long-term glycemic control. Okay, that's pretty much it. Not much uh, else on that. Let me see what else we have. A couple pictures. Here's another picture of uh, diabetic nephropathy really showing some pretty good hyaline arterial sclerosis, but not really the, the uh, Christmas ball effect. What did I say that we had Christmas balls in there? What did I say that was? That's type 4 collagen in there. Okay, that was doing that. What's this? Dry gangrene. That's because related to increased incidence of atherosclerosis resulting in this. And here are your uh, microaneurysms that you commonly see in diabetes. And then here, this is advanced, what they call proliferative retinopathy, where there's been rupture and, and, uh, and separation of the retina, and this is when you can go blind. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to mention was, if they give you, a, and this is a fantastic question, and I'm not sure if they asked it, but if they didn't, they should. And that is, I would say, you got a patient, let's say they're... Um, Let's make it an older patient, 50 years old, who uh, has a blurry vision, goes to an optometrist who gives them a, uh, a prescription for a new set of glasses. So they get it, and two weeks later, they have blurry vision again. Uh, so he goes again, and of course, the refractor uh, is different, so it gives them another prescription, go get it, get it, gets it filled, and one month later, it's blurry vision again. And so there's a constant change in refraction. What's your diagnosis? Diabetes. And you know what's happening. What's happening is you're converting glucose into sorbitol and water's going in and altering the refraction of the lens. And that's why it's absolutely classic. Anyone that's constantly having to change their, lens, their glasses because, uh, you know, on a frequent basis, you have to get a blood glucose level. That's almost a giveaway for being diabetes. It's an absolute classic question. So per people that, that constantly have to get their eyeglasses changed, change, you have to, have to get a blood fasting blood glucose to make your diagnosis. 
Okay, so remember that one. I think that's a great board question. I think uh, uh, you, you could do that. All right, in terms of laboratory, you don't need to know a whole lot on this thing, and that is in terms of all the, all the nuances. Uh, fasting glucose uh, uh, is, a, is a classic way, and if it's greater than 126 milligrams per deciliter on two separate occasions, you have diabetes. I'm going to ask you a question on uh, see if you've got your behavioral science statistics uh, down. In the old days, the fasting blood glucose cutoff was 140 milligrams per deciliter. Now it's uh, 126 milligrams per deciliter. Is that increasing the sensitivity uh, of the uh, test for the diagnosis of diabetes or increasing the specificity of the test for diagnosing diabetes? Sensitivity. By making it lower, in other words, closer to the normal range, then, that's, then you're going to be able to pick up more people uh, that have diabetes. When they set it at 140, that was set for high specificity, so there would be less false positives. In other words, if you were greater than 140, you unequivocally had diabetes. But they recognize now, because of the fact that your glucose levels do determine the severity of pathology, I mean, that now has been unequivocally proven. So they're saying, okay, now we want to make sure that we get all those people real early in the game, so we'll set the test for high sensitivity, okay, to pick up all the people with diabetes, and so they lowered the reference interval to 126. That's a board question. Okay, if you didn't get that, you better read the first section of my high yield in pathology that deals with that, okay, and, it, and all those little statistic things on positive and negative predictive value, you want to know if you have two tests, what's the, chance, what's the percent chance that one of them will be a false positive? If you don't know the answer to that, well, better read the notes. The answer is 5%. So whatever. Okay, actually 10%, excuse me. Uh, so we don't need to do this anymore. Glucose intolerance, don't worry about that. And we did mention gestational diabetes is a woman who didn't have diabetes before she got pregnant. Now she does. Okay, that's called gestational diabetes. And what's, what are some risk factors for the baby if a mommy doesn't have good glycemic control? Respiratory distress syndrome uh, is one, one example. Sometimes premature deliveries, etc. Also, women that do have gestational diabetes are at risk for develop, developing diabetes further on down the pike. So uh, you've got to watch these women. My daughter, for example, she had three, three babies, and, and two of the three pregnancies she was... Uh, she had just gestational diabetes, and so she has to watch herself from now on, her blood sugar, to see if she doesn't go into, di uh, into diabetes mellitus. I think that's about it for diabetes of the key things that they ask on exams. Remember that stuff about amyloid, and believe it or not, they really hone in on that. Amyloid in the, in the beta islets, that's, that's type 2. And then inflammation of the islets, insulitis, antibodies against the islets, that's type 1. Our little friend Kotsaki, by the way, is involved in that. You see, if some of you thought that HLA was type 2, now that's type 1. What does HLA mean if you have a certain HLA type? It means that you have a propensity for developing something. Okay? What it means, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get type 1 diabetes. It means that if you have a certain environmental factor comes into the picture and you're that certain HLA type, that you could potentially develop that disease. And so what would be an environmental factor? Infection. And some of the classic ones that, that are very commonly associated with pushing a patient to type 1 diabetes, if they have that particular HLA type is Coxsackie, uh, mumps, uh, famous, uh, is famous for doing that. Uh, what else? There's a few other. Epstein-Barr virus is famous for doing that. So they're the trigger. They're the trigger. Take HLA B27. Is that if I was HLA B27 positive, does that mean I'm going to get ankylosing spondylitis? Not necessarily. But what if I got a chlamydial infection? Could that be the in fact, an environmental factor that makes me end up with ankyl? Yeah. What if I had ulcerative colitis? Could that be the trigger that makes Yes. What if I had uh, shigellosis? Yes. What if I had uh, psoriasis and I, had, and, I was, and I had HLA B27? That would push me into ankylosing spondylitis. So it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get the disease and you have to have some exposure to some environmental factor that will push you into it. And most commonly in type 1 diabetes, actually, it's a viral infection. And you remember vividly a young lady that, quote, had the flu. Okay? One month later, she was a type 1 diabetic. 
So apparently uh, the, the flu was probably a Coxsackie infection or some other inf viral infection. She was the appropriate HLA type, and she ended up with type 1 diabetes in one month. Well, one month ago, she was perfectly normal, and now she's a type 1 diabetic. That's very, very common presentation. Okay, we're done with uh, endocrine, and we're going to do musculoskeletal, skin, and then CNS, and then we'll have our little slide thing. Musculoskeletal is kind of fun, and I picked out all the key ones that they ask on it. You do know how to have to know how to interpret crystals in the synovial fluid. You do part one and two. In fact, this exact picture was on boards. Okay, we have uh, two diseases, two uh, uh, causes of arthritis that both have uh, uh, crystals in the synovial fluid. One is called uh, gout, and the other one is called um, pseudogout. Now. There are two types of crystals in pseudogout. If you have this, this uh, uh, rhomboid-shaped crystal uh, present in the, in the synovial fluid, I keep on wanting to say spinal fluid. Synovial fluid, that's an automatic diagnosis of pseudogout. So that's actually specific. Little chunky crystal, automatically that's pseudogout. The problem is pseudogout can also have needle-shaped crystals, just like monosodium urate. So you've got a problem in differentiating the two. Okay. So what you do is you um, get a sample of synovial fluid, you put a red filter into it, and it makes the background red, and it makes the crystals yellow or blue depending upon something. It depends upon this little analyzer at the base of the microscope. And so in this particular case, I'm going to arrange, put the little analyzer in a north-south direction. Okay, so I got this little thing and I've set it north-south. Then what you're supposed to do is, is look at all those crystals that are in the same direction as you just put the analyzer, in this case north-south, and look at what the color is. What color is it? What color is it? Yellow. So when it's yellow and parallel to that analyzer, by definition that's negatively birefringent and it's monosodium urate. Okay, now this is a totally different case now. Okay? Totally different. Totally different. Okay, and let's say it's a, it's a knee. Okay, and it's a, it's swollen, an older person. So I'm not really thinking too much gout. I'm wondering about pseudogout. So I, I do it, and I see needle-shaped crystals. Okay, and this time I'm going to uh, just for fun separate and put it in an east-west direction. East-west direction. I'm going to uh, put that little analyzer. What color is the crystal? Don't look at me. Look it up there. Okay, east-west. What's the color? Blue. When it's blue and parallel to the way you have set the analyzer. That, by definition, is positively birefringent crystal, and it defines pseudogout. So when it's yellow and parallel to your analyzer, it's gout. When it's blue and parallel to the way you set your analyzer, it's pseudogout. It's extremely simple. Okay? This one here is showing the direction that the analyzer was sent, and you can see that it has a blue color. So blue and parallel would have been pseudogout. There you go. Good. Now... We have lots of different types of arthritis. The most common is osteoarthritis. Is that an inflammatory arthritis? No. It's rheumatoid arthritis. Yes. Ankylosing spondylitis. Yes. Good. They got that down. So let's deal with the most common one, osteoarthritis. Okay. Now, what is it? Osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis is purely a wearing down of articular cartilage. Guys, everyone in this room is going to wear down their cartilage and their weight-bearing joints to some degree. So we're all going to get a little bit of osteoarthritis, but some will get it a little bit worse because of some genetic uh, tendencies in some cases, okay? And some will not get it too bad, okay? So you're basically wearing down articular cartilage. And if you look over here in this joint, the blue staining stuff is articular cartilage. And I think you can see it's really worn it down quite a bit. In fact, uh, the, the joint space is quite narrow in there, as you can see. So you're constantly wearing it down, and so there's a reaction to injury that occurs at the margin of that joint to this, to this wearing down of the cartilage. And you can see that the reaction to injury has produced a little bit of bone formation right at the edge of the joint, and that's called an osteophyte or a spur. Okay? And that's just a reaction to injury from this constant wearing down, wearing down of the articular cartilage. Okay? So who can tell me what the name of that is? What, what term do you call it? That's Heberdeen's note. Okay, now, you know, it's not a lymph node. It's a horrible term to use. It's not a lymph node. What it is is an osteophyte in that joint. That's what that bump is. Okay, that's Heberdeen's node. It's basically an osteophyte. 
Uh, this patient also has some uh, some uh, uh, involvement over here, your uh, interphalangeal joints, and so that's called Bouchard node, and that's also an example of an osteophyte that's doing that. So let's make sure you know the joints, okay? We're not talking about marijuana here, we're talking about joints. What are these, what are your knuckles? Metacarpal phalangeal joints. What are, what are the next one? Proximal interphalangeal joints. What's this? Distal interphalangeal joints. So in other words, osteoarthritis involves which two? DIP, distal, and PIP. What is rheumatoid arthritis? MCP and PIP. Okay, so where the joints are involved is, is different than the two. They both can involve the proximal interphalangeal joint. Good. Guys, that's all I really have to say about osteoarthritis. There's not much more to say. What's this up on top? Rheumatoid arthritis. You notice the swelling of the what joints? MCP joints. The first one usually is the second one here. Second and third are the ones that usually start off. Now, is this an inflammatory joint disease? Yes. And uh, what is it actually that's setting up the inflammation? It's RH, it's, uh, it's, it's the uh, uh, rheumatoid factor. What is rheumatoid factor? Define it. It's an IgM antibody against IgG. And so what happens, uh, this, uh, these IgM antibodies against IgG are in the synovial fluid. And they form complexes with each other, in a sense form immune complexes, which activate the complement system, neutrophils and stuff come in, and you start damaging start damaging the joint. And what happens is the synovial tissue starts getting inflamed from all this stuff and starts getting hyperplastic and starts growing and growing and growing and it grows over the articular cartilage and starts destroying that cartilage. What's that, what's that synovial tissue called that's, gro called that's growing over the articular cartilage and panis? Don't confuse that with tophus, please. Tophus is in, is in gout. This is panis. Panis, and basically what it is is synovial tissue that is that is hyperplastic and, and and is growing over the surface of the articular cartilage and destroying it. And because it is destroying it, it's going to produce as a reaction to injury fibrosis eventually. And so the joints of rheumatoid arthritis can be ankylosed; they can be fixed; they can be so that they don't move. You never had that with osteoarthritis because it's not an inflammatory joint disease. You, you won't get fixing of the joint. But if rheumatoids don't keep moving their joints, okay, what, and, and they're not being treated properly with anti-inflammatories, eventually they're going to get ankylosis of the joint and it can't move at all from this disease. Okay? So this picture right here has been very commonly shown on boards because it shows the classic ulnar deviation of the joints that one expects. Notice it's a symmetrical disease. You usually have it in both extremities. And what are these called? Those are rheumatoid nodules. Can you see them in any other disease? Rheumatic fever. Those are the nodules of rheumatic fever. Now sometimes patients with rheumatoid arthritis have, uh, usually older patients with rheumatoid arthritis say, Doc, I'm having trouble eating and swallowing crackers. Okay? And it feels like there's sand in my eye all the time. And so you look at their tongue and there it is and what do you see? It's dry, okay? And then you look in their eyes, and it's dry. What's your diagnosis? Sjogren's syndrome. There you go. That's Sjogren's syndrome. That's a, a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis, and then they develop an autoimmune destruction of their lacrimal glands, okay? And the, uh, so what ends up happening is you get carotid conjunctivitis sick of dry eyes, dry eyes, and so that's why they feel like there's sand in their eyes. And also you destroy the minor salivary glands and you have a dry mouth. Dry eyes, dry mouth, rheumatoid arthritis, Sjogren's syndrome. Sjogren's syndrome. Anybody remember the name of the syndrome where you have rheumatoid nodules in the lung along with a pneumoconiosis? Cap, you shouldn't have any problem remembering that. Okay. I think that's all I really need to say about rheumatoid arthritis. Part two is going to ask you how they're now treating the initial disease in most centers, and that's methotrexate. They're not even fiddling around with aspirin anymore or indomethacin. They're going right to the money, methotrexate, because they find out by hitting them early, they get less severe damage in the long run. So they go the methotrexate route. Okay. So that'd be a great question. You've got a patient with rheumatoid arthritis that develops a microcyte, macrocytic anemia with hypersegmented neutrophils. Neurologic exam is normal. What drug is he on? 
methotrexate. There you go. See, that's how I would ask that question. Not what drug would you put a patient on rheumatoid arthritis? And that's nothing. Okay, so you give, if you put them on this drug and you give a, get some complication of this drug, and then you have to figure out what the drug is. I could also have said interstitial fibrosis in a lung. Methotrexate does that too. <sighs> Hurts, doesn't it? Okay, what's this patient have? Gout. They sometimes call this podagra. Usually the first joint involved in acute gouty arthritis is the big toe. And it almost always happens at night. Okay, and what ha what's happening is, is that you're precipitating those monosodium urate crystals in the synovial fluid. The neutrophils are phagocytosing that and release their chemicals, you know, all their enzymes, and that's producing the inflammatory reaction that's going on in this thing, okay? Does an elevated uric acid level automatically mean you have gout? No. I would dare say that probably 25% of people in this room have an elevated uric acid level. And you don't have gout. Okay, so what defines gout? Well, you have to have a, uh, a, an inflammatory joint like that, and you have had to have stuck a needle into it and documented that there are monosodium urate crystals in it. Now you've diagnosed gout. In fact, there are cases of gout where the uric acid levels are normal. Okay, but the joints have the, have the crystal in them. That's gout. So you don't define gout on the basis of the uric acid level. Now, most of the time, they treat the initial disease with an anti-inflammatory agent. Colchicine is out now. It's too toxic. The people get too sick. They don't use that anymore. They use indomethacin most of the time. And, that, and then they control the inflammation. But once they've done that, then what they have to do is decide what caused the gout. So you have to think of two things. Is it an overproduction of uric acid or is it an under-excretion of uric acid? In other words, are they making too much, or are they not able to get rid of it in the kidneys? Well, I can tell you, over 90% of cases are under excretion. So if that's true, and it is, and Trevor taught you about drugs that are used in treating gout, we have allopurinol for the overproducers, and we have probenicid, and what other drug that sounds like an antibiotic, sulfenpyrazone, as uricosuric agents. That's it, right? And so if you define that the patient, this, let's say this patient over here was an underproducer, then what would be the drug of choice? Probenicid or sulfenpyrazone. But if it turned out that this patient was an overproducer, which would be uncommon, what would the drug of choice be? Allopurinol. How does that work, please? It blocks exanthine oxidase. That's right. Very good. Now, if you have gout and you don't take care of it real good, it can become chronic. And the sine qua known for the presence of chronic gout is a tophus. A tophus. Now, this is a tophus. That's not a giant malleolus, by the way. Okay, it looks like one, but it ain't. That's a tophus. If that's a giant malleolus, then needs a baby malleoli down here. Okay? Uh, what you would do, if you stuck that with a, uh, a lance, okay, what would come out? Well, basically crystalline material. And you took a section through it and all that stuff, it'd all polarize, it'd be multinucleated giant cells, a foreign body reaction against it. That's a tophus. That's the deposition of monosodium urate in soft tissue. And this is one of the favorite areas, but it also can be seen in the hand, okay, sometimes in the ear. You get these very disfiguring collections of, uh, of, of monosodium urate in soft tissue. And by the way, it's very destructive when it's next to a joint, it actually erodes away the joint. You get some rip roaring disabling arthritis with this. Once you have a tophus, the only treatment available to you from the henceforth is allopurinol. They don't use any other drug when they get chronic uh, gout or uh, something with tophus. Here's an example of a tophus polarized. And all this is is monosodium urate. And here's an example of a tophus that was on a patient's finger. Look what the heck it did to that, to that joint. Look at that, how it eroded it. So it produces a very, very disabling arthritis. Let's see. Genetics, multifactorial inheritance. In other words, a little bit of genetics and a lot of environmental factors. So what would I not want to eat if I was that bad gal? Red meats would be bad. Why? Because they're full of purines. Okay? Red wine, very good. What else? Alcohol. Okay? You want to know why alcohol? You want to know why alcohol has a lot of association with gout? Here it is. The answer is this, it's, it's metabolic acidosis. 
You see, uric acid and all the acids in our body have to compete with each other for excretion in a proximal tubule. And so you already know that in alcoholics, they have lactic acid dose and beta hydroxybutyric ketoacidosis. Agreed? So uric acid is going to have to compete with those two acids for excretion in the proximal tubule. And so who's winning? Well, lactic acid and beta hydroxy, there's more of it. So uric acid is waiting and waiting and it's building up, building up, building up. Boom! You get that appropriate solubility product, you end up with gout. So it has to do with the ability to get rid of the uric acid uh, from the kidneys uh, and, and having to compete with other acids for excretion. That's the reason for it in, uh, in alcoholics. All right, now this person looks like they're looking down for something, but actually when you talk to them, they'd be turning around to you like this, okay? They turn around like that to you, and they got this hunched over back, which obviously has some great effect on their ability to breathe. It's going to restrict the movement of their chest cavity, and now we're going to have uh, blood gas abnormalities with this. Okay, this patient, uh, when he was young, uh, maybe 20, 21, in the morning when he woke up, he had Tremendous pain right back in here. Now, I got pain in my sacroiliac. And little did he know that was a correct. That was correct. And when they did X-rays, there's your sacroiliac, and you see that there's some there's some inflammatory reaction right where that is. And classically, they wake up in the morning with severe lower back pain right in the sacroiliac, and as the day progresses, they start feeling better. That's just classic. But then eventually what happens is the inflammation also involves the vertebral column and you get fusion of the, of the vertebral column, so-called bamboo spine. And that's when they start going over like this. Now, un unfortunately, that's not the only part of this disease. I mean, they get this, they're usually, as, as you know, HLA B27 positive. Um, they unfortunately get a couple other things associated with this that have nothing to do with bones. I tried aortitis. They have inflammation of the aorta and commonly have aortic regurgitation. And they commonly have uh, uveitis and, and uh, iridocyclitis with blurry vision and they could potentially go blind. So there's a little bit more than just the, just the arthritic changes in this that you can occur. What's the name of that genetic disease where you can get uh, uh, degenerative arthritis in the vertebral column and other places and if you did an autopsy, you'd see that the, uh, the, vertebra, the cartilage in between the vertebrae was a black color. You can have these patients urinate, and then you expose it to sunlight, and you see right before your eyes it turned black. That's how captainuria, okay, autosomal recessive disease, homogentizate oxidase is absent, and so there's a buildup of homogentizic acid, and on exposure to light it turns black. And when it, when it deposits into, into your uh, cartilages, it absolutely destroys them. And you get this black pigment in there. That's an absolute favorite question on boards because they've got a biochemistry cartel in. Okay. Now, here's a guy. That was a bad boy. He ended up with dysuria. It increased frequency. He did a urinalysis. He had lots of neutrophils, but you couldn't really see any bacteria at all. His leukocyte esterase was positive, but his, his nitrite was negative, and you cultured the urine. There was nothing in it. So in a sense, that's sterile pyuria, isn't it? Then finally, you woke up and said, are you sexually active? Yeah. Okay, when was your last sex contact? Oh, last week. Nonspecific urethritis, chlamydia. And then this guy gets treated for his chlamydia, and then about two, a couple weeks later, he starts getting a sterile conjunctivitis, and he's starting to get some pain back down here, and right at his Achilles tendon, right down there, it's hurting like the devil. Now what does he have? Ryder syndrome. So this guy's actually B27 positive, and what was his environmental trigger that pushed him into developing ankylosing spondylitis, chlamydia, which is the most common one of all. This is a sterile conjunctivitis. This is not a chlamydia conjunctivitis. And that thing I told you about the Achilles tendon was on part one. Okay, that's they get an Achilles tendonitis. Right where the Achilles tendon inserts into the calcaneus, right there, there's an inflammatory reaction. It's absolutely pathic mnemonic for Ryder syndrome. Believe it or not, it was on part one. I mean, I can see that for part two, but they put it on part one. Okay. Why am I showing an ulcerative colitis over here in all of this uh, business of ankylosing spondylitis? Because that can be an environmental figure, uh, 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 
thing in a patient that's actually B27 positive and pushing them into an ankylosing spondylitis. So there's a lot of different things, psoriasis, uh, chlamydia, ulcerative colitis, shigella, lots of different things can push you into ankylosing spondylitis if you're HLA B27 positive. It can occur in women too. Not as common, but you can see it in women too. Okay, this was a very bad boy. Okay, got a hot joint. That's his knee. It's got this pustule on his palm. That's aspirated. So we aspirate that pustule, and we see gram-negative diplococci in those neutrophils. What does this patient have? Disseminated gonococcemia. Disseminated gonococcemia. I want you to remember STD, sexually transmitted disease. It summarizes what you see in it. S means that you have a synovitis, and so in other words, they get inflammation of the of the uh, of joints, and specifically uh, the knees, the big joint. T stands for tenosynovitis. That's uh, the in the joints, in the in the uh, hands, and in the feet. And then that's the STD. D means dermatitis. That's the pustules that they get also near their hands and feet. And very commonly, if you aspirate them, you can see the GC right in them. Does anyone happen to remember from the immunology lectures what would really help predispose you? Let's say you did get GC. Okay, not everyone's going to get disseminated disease, but what if, what complement components? If you were missing these complement components, you'd be absolutely guaranteed in going disseminated. C5 through C9. In other words, that final comet pathway. Okay, C5, we, some people say C6, who cares? It's the final common pathway. And the reason for that is you need those complement components to phagocytose Nigeria gonorrhea. So if you're deficient in them, and then you did get GC, in other words, you're not getting it just because you're deficient in that. I mean, you, you got it from other things, and you happen to be negative for those complement components, you'll, get, you'll disseminate. You'll get disseminated disease. I hate to tell you this, but the most common cause of septic arthritis in the United States is gonorrhea, mm -hmm. GC. And it'll be in the knee. Well, here we got a watermelon pit that's walking. Okay, so we got a walking watermelon pit. But this little watermelon pit bit this dude right there. And then it looks like you dropped a pebble in the water and you had these concentric circles going out. Like you'd see if you dropped a pebble in the water. Who could put that together for me? Well, that's erythema chronica migrans, right? And what does this patient have? Lyme's disease. Organism. Borrelia burgdorferi. Tick. Ox Ioxides tick. Okay, very good. This is pathognomonic of Lyme's disease. You see it, you treat them. You treat them with uh, tetracycline. If you don't treat them, okay, and you miss this, and they go on into the chronic stages, then you're going to have a problem. Now, the disabling joint disease is nothing compared to the other things you get, like myocarditis. And listen, pearl for you, pearl. Any patient, any patient, you know, we're in Lyme's disease country. I mean, Connecticut ain't too far from here. Long Island, Long Island, don't walk, don't walk in the woods in Long Island. You're guaranteed to get ioxidase ticks on you. You all know that, okay? Big time problem. Um, Bilateral Bell's palsy. Usually idiopathic Bell's palsy is due to herpes simplex. Usually, not always. And it's unilateral. When it's bilateral, it's Lyme's disease until proven otherwise. Because the most common cranial nerve involved in chronic Lyme's disease is the seventh nerve. Okay, That's literally pathognomonic. Bilateral Bell's palsy. And idiopathic Bell's palsy, it's only one side. When it's both sides... You're talking about Lyme's disease. Now I'm going to trick you. You ready? Let's we'll see how well you were taught microbiology. Let's say this person developed a hemolytic anemia. And you looked at the peripheral blood and you saw something abnormal. What did you see? Babesia microtii. Remember, this tick, Ioxides damini, actually has a reservoir for the Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's the white-tailed deer. Also, the white-tailed deer has Babesia in it. And so this tick carries, can carry two diseases, Borrelia burgdorferi producing Lyme's and Babesia microtii, which is an intraerythrocytic parasite that produces a hemolytic anemia. Looks very similar, 
to the ring form that you saw of plasmodium falciparum. So you can get both. In fact, I read that 20% of people with Lyme disease have the babesiosis as well. So you want to remember that, that this, this, this tick is carrying two diseases with it. And if one of them, patient has a hemolytic anemia, you know what the answer is, babesiosis. Very common, guys, so perfect board question, in my opinion. If you have chronic disease, you treat them with ceftriaxone. When they have the early form, you treat them with tetracycline. Both have been asked on part one. <sighs> this exact picture has been on so many boards, but a second-year medical student thinks it's a foreign body in the eye. They must think, hey, this place must have been playing horseshoes and got it in the eye. I think maybe not, because if they were, then they were miniature people that were playing this. And they completely missed the fact that there's a bluish discoloration to the sclera. And they completely missed osteogenesis imperfecta. Okay, this is the picture that is shown on all boards on osteogenesis imperfecta. But they know that you know that there's a picture out there on osteogenesis imperfecta. So they've gone a step further. They're not going to say, what is it? That's an idiot question. They're going to ask you, what's the defect? The answer, what's the defect? They can't make type 1 collagen. That's one thing, but they ask you type 1 collagen. They cannot make that. It's defective synthesis of type 1 collagen. You know what they asked? What's the mechanism of the blue sclera? <laughs> Well, those of you that are a little bit light-skinned, look at your forearm. What's the color of your veins underneath your skin? Blue. Okay. Well, what's this called? Sclera, right? Well, there's collagen in sclera. And since, you have, since your type when collagen is defective, then it's thin, isn't it? And so, therefore, what you're seeing is it's so thin there because you don't have collagen there, you're seeing the underlying choroidal veins. And so basically, it's the reflection of the veins underneath there, the choroidal veins, that gives the blue color to the sclera. It had nothing to do with any discoloration of it. It's just showing the veins underneath. Just like your veins are blue, look through your skin. They look blue through your sclera. That's thin. Clever, isn't it? Where do you think I found that out? Oh, I had to look for that one. I had to look for that one. I wasn't about to let that one go. Okay, because certainly Robbins didn't have that. Okay, and a lot of internal medicine books didn't have it either. I forget actually where I did find it. It might have been Nelson's the textbook at Pisa. I'm not exactly sure, but it is a correct fact. So they even ask that because they know that you know that this picture's there. They shot a kid with an eyeball. I'll say it's effective. Now there's a disease called osteopetrosis which is a defect in osteoclast, which, so you can't break bone down, and so yeah, it's called brittle bone disease. And so what happens there is that if you can't break bone down, you have no marrow. Okay, so you have severe anemias and different nerves and crap like that get caught in there, and that's called brittle bone disease. So that's a defect in osteoclast. And sometimes they try to pass that off as osteogenesis imperfect, which is a defect in making type 1 collagen, not a defect in osteoclast. That's osteopetrosis. That's your uh, articular cartilage there, and not, not articulate, the cartilage in there between your vertebral column. Is that a normal width? No. It's kind of thin, don't you think? What's this hump called? Moon, huh? Moon? No. That's a dowager's hump in a patient with osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. What's the mechanism of osteoporosis in the elderly woman? You're breaking more bone down than you're putting in. And the reason why you're breaking more bone down than putting in is that you don't have enough estrogen to inhibit interleukin-1, osteoclast activating factor, from breaking your bone down. Osteoporosis is an overall reduction in bone mass. That's both the mineral and organic component of bone. Osteomalacia is, a, is de decreased mineralization. The organic part of the bone is totally normal. Cartilage is okay. Osteoid is okay. It's just that you're not mineralizing it. Osteoporosis, both of them are decreased. The mineral content and the organic compound. So the whole mass of the bone is decreased. You diagnose it with dual beam for, uh, what do they call that? Dual beam absorptiometry. And they measure the density of bone in different areas of the body, somewhere around the hand area. 
and they can tell what the density of bone is. And that's the, it's a non-invasive test, very easy to do. Now, the most common fraction you're looking at, fracture you're looking at, the compression fractures, you literally are collapsing in your vertebral column. And you will lose stature. You, if you were a five foot two, you're going to be four foot nine. Okay, with this thing. And basically, the very weight of your head is causing you to lean forward like that and your back to go out because of the weakness of the bone there. The second most common fracture is the Collie's fracture of the distal radius. Okay. Is swimming a good exercise to prevent osteoporosis? No. Why? No stress on bone. That was a board question. Oh, it's a great exercise for aerobics. I'm not saying it's not good for that. But because the water is basically holding you up and taking off the stress off of you, it's a horrible thing for preventing osteoporosis. So you have to stress bone to build it up. That's why they recommend walking. They actually found out that actually if a woman will do weight training, uh, weight training using weights, that's even better than walking. Because that even puts a greater stress on it. So if I were a woman, which I'm not, <laughs> I would walk with some dumbbells in my hand. And I'd be moving those little suckers, and maybe put some, put some little weights on, your, on there and get that extra weight and walking so you get your aerobics and your bone mass increased. Remember, the biggest problem in space is a lack of gravity and osteoporosis. That's why they carry ast astronauts off the spaceships, because they don't want them walking because they had serious osteoporosis after they've been in space, and they have to give them bisphosphonates and, and calcium and, and uh, all those different things, vitamin D, uh, to before they get their density back. So they haven't figured out how to get around uh, preventing osteoporosis in space. Okay. By the way, you know what you women should be on now, even if you're not uh, uh, postmenopausal? Okay, you need to exercise and do the things that I just said, too. You need uh, 1,500 milligrams of calcium every day, and you need 400 to 800 units of vitamin D every day. Also, you need a vitamin pill that contains iron. Those are all normal primary prevention things that every young woman in a reproductive period of life should be doing. Okay. Good. We're done with that. Couple bone tumors. I don't ask a whole lot on bone tumors. So I'm going to show you the two most common cartilaginous ones. Then I'm going to show you the one that's uh, uh, involving bone. This actually is the overall most common bone tumor right here. And you ever see people that have these little knobby excrescences? So maybe let's say over here and you have this big knob there and you can feel that it's bone. That's called an uh, uh, osteochondroma. Okay, and what that is, is a little overgrowth, it's a neoplasm of cartilage, and it's a little overgrowth of cartilage, and it's capped by, by, uh, uh, by bone on the surface. So it's a little overgrowth of, of cartilage. Some people call them exostoses. Uh, that's what that is. If you, unfortunately, have Olier's disease, and you got these all over your body, uh, you are run a risk for developing chondral sarcoma. So this little increase in, in, uh, in, uh, in cartilage capped by a little bit of bone, those are the most common overall bone tumor. This is the most common malignant one. This is called a chondral sarcoma. Okay. You already saw this. Okay, this is osteogenic sarcoma. Always think the knee area with this one, distal femur, proximal tibia, adolescent. So they talk about bone pain down here, the knee area there, and a young adolescent, or maybe early 20s, always think osteogenic sarcoma. Okay, and let's look at this one. Notice that it develops in a metaphysis of bone. Notice that it is invaded up into the muscle, went through the periosteum. You can see a little bit of a, of a lifting of the periosteum. Yes, so on an x-ray, that would look like a triangle. Okay, now this happens to be in the shoulder of this particular one, so there's always exceptions to the rule. And you can see this, you see these little spicules of bone there? That's called a sunburst appearance. So sunburst appearance, Codman triangle. Knee area, adolescent, osteogenic sarcoma. Anybody remember the suppressor gene relationship? RB suppressor gene chromosome? 13. Very good. Now, this little poor little dude over here on your left is not practicing for track. This little dude looks like he's got a pretty good set of calves there, except it's pseudohypertrophy. It's actually fat. 
And why, the reason why this poor little kid is doing this is he's climbing up on his legs to stand up. Okay, it's called Gower's Maneuver. This little kid has an elevated CMCK, and he has an absence of a certain protein, name me, dystrophin. What does he have? Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Genetics, sex-linked recessive. Missing what? Dystrophin. Just remember, dystrophy, dystrophin. Okay, but they went beyond that on this. They looked at this, and they said there's a variant of this disease, okay, and they wanted to know what the mechanism of that was. Of course, the variant is Becker's dystrophy. It's still sex-linked recessive, and what's the difference? Oh, they make death dystrophin, but it's abnormal dystrophin. So there's no dystrophin in Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and they do make dystrophin in Becker's, but it's defective. They asked it, guys, and so you got to play the game. There's an analogy to this if you're interested, and that's alpha-1 anatrypsin deficiency. Some of you that are into pediatrics know that the most common cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in children is alpha-1 anatrypsin deficiency. Okay, and yet you also know that adults get panacin or emphysema, and it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Well, the answer to this is, is as follows. There's many different subtypes of alpha-1 anatrypsin. There's a type where you don't make alpha-1 anatrypsin at all. In that case, you will end up as a young adult with panacin or emphysema. There's another type, however, where you do make alpha-1 anatrypsin, but you can't get it out of your hepatocytes. And when you do PAS stains, of the hepatocytes in these kids, you see lots and lots and lots of alpha-1 anatrypsin, except it can't get out of the hepatocyte. And so it damages the hepatocyte and predisposes the hepatocellular carcinoma. Is that not a little bit analogous to what we just said about Duchesne versus Becker's? In Becker's, you don't make dystrophin. And the one that has pain, acid, or emphysema, you don't make alpha-1 anatrypsin. Right? I mean, uh, uh, I say, did I say my muscular dystrophy? You don't make, this, as in, in Duchenne's, you don't make dystrophin, whereas the uh, pain, acid, or emphysema, you don't make alpha-1 anatrypsin. Okay? In the kids that have cirrhosis related to alpha-1 anatrypsin, they make it, but it's defective. In Decker's, they make dystrophin, but it's defective. There's an analogy there. And so if you can remember one of those, then you'll be able to remember that link on the other one, and you'll end up with three or four questions right. That's pretty cool. Let's break.